because it's even the more the most expensive ones were like three hundred fifty dollars something like that. But that was the ones that were even more expensive. How y'all doing tonight? Good to see everyone here. Gonna sing, our God is greater. Our God is stronger. Our God is like, unlike any other. Let's all stand and sing. Water you turn into wine. Open the eyes of the blind, there's no one like you, none like you. Into the darkness you shine, out of the ashes we rise, there's no one like you, none like you.
glad our God is stronger. Thank you so much. You can be seated tonight. Let's pray. God, we just thank you for the opportunity to come here, to worship together, to worship you, to praise your name, God, amidst everything that may go on in our lives as individuals and as a, as a society today. God, we just thank you that we can lean on you and trust your promises. Continue to be with us. Thank you for your love. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, good evening, everybody out there watching in internet land. Hope y'all are having a good week. I'm glad you joined us tonight. I do want to remind everybody, Sunday morning, we'll have our Sunday school classes. Uh, Brother Bob's class is back open and, and Brother Levi's class. So uh, please, there's, there's something for everybody right now. Uh, there's still a couple more classes. We're waiting on the children's. Just a couple more people to be available. And uh, the, the, another older class. Uh, we're almost there. So we have enough open for everybody, so I just wanted to remind you of that. Uh, come be with us at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning for Sunday school, and then, of course, for our services at 11 and 6. Um, but I'm, I'm glad you joined us tonight and hope you're, you're ready to worship. Uh, we're going to really pick up where we left off last night on our study and, and tonight talk about how to be a soldier for Christ. So glad you're here. All right, let's continue in. Praising our Lord, singing the old rugged cross. Jesus is who we say we are. 
And if it wasn't for that cross and Jesus dying, we would not have that relationship that we can have with him tonight.
glad you can say that about children of God. Let's pray once more. God, I just thank you so much once again to come here and worship you with the freedom knowing that you love me so very much and you love those that are listening so much as well. I just pray that there may be someone listening tonight that may be struggling with something, God, or may not even know you as their personal Savior. God, just let them feel your love tonight. Let them grab these words that come out of these scriptures, Lord, and just hold on tight to them, knowing that they are your promises for us. Thank you so much once again for bringing us here together. In your name we pray. Amen. You can turn with me to uh, 2 Timothy, chapter number 2. Uh, we're going to kind of go back, as I alluded before, to what we left off last week. We, we talked about standing guard last week. And we, we read through uh, 1 Timothy, chapter 1. And we, we kind of landed in verse 9 and 10 and down through there and, and got a description of what it is that we're supposed to guard, that we're told to guard, or that's been uh, committed to us. That's where we got the guarding from in verses 13 and 14. And really last week we talked about what it is that we're supposed to guard and what that meant. And it was really not, not earning our salvation, not keeping it from being stolen from us where we would be lost, but really living up to the expectation and the specialness that's a word, the specialness of what Christ has put in us. That he, he, he planned before the foundation of the world. That he bled and died for us to have. Tonight, he goes a little further on and we have to realize this letter. And, and, and Most of you know this. that First and second Timothy is a pastoral epistle that he is writing personally to Timothy. He did the same thing for the book of Titus. To help him, to build him up in the ministry. And we take it today for the same thing, for pastoral advice and, and those things. But it, it doesn't mean we can't use the same principles for our individual ministries. In our individual ministries, we, we talked about last, last week, it is simply guarding what Jesus has given us. And treating it in appreciation for what he's given us. And really living like it. And, and, and kind of holding that fast. He goes on tonight. And he's going to start in verse two or chapter two this way. He says, "There, thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ." We get the idea that to have this guarding. To, to take care of what we have, we have a job to do. And that job is to be a soldier. It is to go forward for Christ. But, but the biggest thing, what we're going to see from verses 3 all the way down to the end of the chapter, we're not going to cover every verse, but we're going to kind of go through. And if we're supposed to be a soldier, if we're supposed to keep this guard, it gives us the same idea of what, what we've been talking about last week. How do we do that? Um... And not just a step-by-step, -step, how do we do that? What does that actually look like? Some of y'all have heard more sermons than I've been alive. And I've heard a lot of sermons about being a soldier for Christ and standing up for Christ. And I've heard a lot myself. And sometimes we get so excited about the idea of it that really we don't get past the point, okay, what, what really does the Bible say about me standing guard for Christ? Or me actually, what is actually being a soldier of Christ? We get the idea, okay, I, I know that's for me standing against the devil, against sin in my life, against sin outside. I, I know that's reading my Bible and praying, but, but what does that actual look like in my life? Like, I know that's the basics of it, but how do I do that? And remember, Paul is writing to Timothy, and the idea that we get is Timothy, whether it was because of his youth, because of it was insecurities, or for whatever, he wasn't standing, standing up very boldly. And standing up with very, very much authority from what we get from the first couple chapters. So he is telling him and reminding him, we talked about last week, exactly what he's got and exactly who he is to 
come on with it. Remember what you got, so stand for it. He's coming on now. Here's how you do that. And he's given him this example of being a soldier. But what we're going to see through every bit of this, three things we want to pick out, is to, to be a soldier or to guard something, you got to have a focus. I, I've never been to England, but we've all seen it on TV. They got the fellas standing out there in front of the palace with red suits, and they got the 10 foot hats on. They ain't 10 foot, but they're pretty big, you know. They're standing out there with a the guard, and everybody's seen some kind of movie where a guy's trying to be a smart aleck and out there messing with him, making him laugh. I saw a real video where the guy was being a punk, and, and you know, I'm, don't go look this up. I don't, I don't know where it was at. I mean, you can look it up. But the guy messed with him so much, and he finally touched him, and the guard knocked him out. And then he put his hat back on, picked up his gun, and went back to standing still. <laughs> That's pretty cool. But them guys, they stand guard, and they have one focus. It's to stand right there and not move and make sure nothing that's not supposed to be happening is going to happen. You say, well, that's pretty easy to see. Well, being a Christian, we make it awfully complicated. That's, that's what being a soldier for Christ is. Because our focus has to be a laser focus on one thing and not like a little puppy dog chasing a ball. And that's how most Christians are. We're led away so easily because we see something we like. And uh, I, I'm guilty of it. And, and so are you. So we just don't have to feel bad about that. We'll get on about it and, and learn how to do better. That single focus we know that we have is Jesus. So much of, of being a soldier for Christ it, is this getting it stuck in my mind, and we're going to talk more about this in just a second, that he tells Timothy, is just look in the right direction and not putting pressure on yourself, not trying to be something you're not. I know in Christ I'm royalty. I know in Christ I'm somebody, but I'm really nothing. Like, absolutely nothing. The only thing that is worth something is Jesus in me. So, with that reality, I'm not supposed to feel down in the dumps about it. I'm pretty, still pretty excited that I'm nothing, but I'm something because of him. But with that thought process, I have to take the focus off on me and focus on him. And I, I put this verse up here because every time I get a chance, I read it because it's one of my favorite verses. But it says this, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. That pretty much says it all when we look to Jesus. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. And we don't need to look any further than him. We don't need to get looking around. Uh, Daddy told me it used to be horrible to sit in a church, and he said, Papa, I'll be preaching. And he said it was a bad deal if, if them glasses wouldn't stain, if the, the windows, not the glasses. He said, because I can't tell you how many times I got in trouble when I was a little boy. And I something would catch my eye, a squirrel or something out there playing. And I'd get to watching that squirrel. And the next thing I'd hear is, Jesse, <laughs> your daddy calling you from the pulpit. <laughs> and that's just a good example of, of what we do. We don't mean to. We're not trying to be ugly. But we have to have our focus on where we're supposed to be. And, and this verse, for me, it goes back every time. The focus of Christianity the focus of my life as a whole is Jesus. Um, what, what, and I know we've talked about it before. What would Jesus do? Uh, for whatever good and bad that was, is the movement that it was, it's still a good thought process to have. I'm going to do this. What would Jesus do that? And uh, a lot of times I have to stop and just ask him what he wants to do because that ain't what I was going to do. Um, so we have to have a focus. We're going to talk about three things. Realizing what we are, and we know that's a soldier, we'll get to it. Learn exactly what that means. And then we have to learn to live by his creed. So let's jump right in it. There's a good bit we want to get through. We're soldiers. Once again, let's read verse 3. In verse 4, he says, There therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. We're chosen by Jesus. And once again, this keeps coming up over and over and over. And the more I read the scripture, the more I'm baffled by this whole election and, 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 and whosoever will together. And uh, he's given me more peace and more peace and more peace. And I hope he is too, you too. 
The whole issue is I don't know how I was chosen. I don't know how I said yes, but I know what happened. And I know I'm born again. And I know he's touched me. And I, I read, when I read this, it excites me because he chose me for something. And that was to, to join in his army. We sang it in, in vacation Bible school almost every year. I'm in the Lord's army, right? Yes, sir. And I'm not going to do the dances for you. I don't make you feel bad by my excellent uh, in the Lord's army routine. Um, Kyle's back there handling it out right there, shooting off the artillery. Don't, don't tear nothing up back here now, brother. <laughs> but that's exactly what we are, and that's the idea we have to have. And get our mindset stuck on that we're actually fighting a battle. Once again, we have a lot of church lingo we get in our minds. Onward, Christian soldiers. We get fired up on Sunday, we'll sing that song. And we might even have the marching in our minds. And then comes Monday, how do I really do that? How does that really play along? Usually something, something comes up and it takes our mind off our focus and we couldn't, we couldn't have been a soldier no more than, than we was a, a professional basketball player. We just get completely thrown off. And some of these things about being a soldier, is we just have to simply look back. If we're soldiers and Jesus is our commander-in-chief, which he is, he's king, we have to look back to who he is and what he is to realize what it means for us to be a soldier. The biggest thing, and I don't like either one of these, because I'm still trying to, and I, it's something about my flesh, I'm still trying to hang on to that wrong idea that I had when I got saved, that now that I was born again, everything was going to be beautiful. It was going to be perfect. I entered into this Christian utopia where I was just going to see victory and power in my life, and Jesus, just, man, he's going to do this thing. And nothing ever was going to go wrong. Well, I had part of that right. Jesus was going to be all over it, and he was going to do all kind of stuff. But the more and more I read my Bible, the more and more it, it, it kind of turns me from my own mindset to what Paul talked about so many times. He says, he talked about how it was a privilege to suffer like Jesus suffered. He talked about it was, it was a privilege to join in the power of his suffering. Even we, we learned about history, and I ordered these books. I didn't tell Brittany yet, but I guess you'll know now. But hopefully I get to read some about this. Some of our early church history tells us even about the apostles. And, and I ordered these books of Josephus, and, and there's two others that were New Testament historians. So y'all hear more about that coming up when I get them. I'm going to dive into them. But we know from some of these historians, people like the apostle Peter. He was, he was crucified for who he was in Christ. But he said, no, you can't crucify me upright. I, I don't, I'm not worthy to die like Jesus did. He was happy to die. He was happy to suffer. For us as Christians, we have to get the mindset that even uncomfortable situations, we can't run from. Um, and and I, I've already seen this in ministry. As soon as something doesn't work exactly like it's supposed to, my first reaction and, and me and Brittany's joint reaction, usually she tells me before I, 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 I say anything, she, she's a bigger cheerleader for me and a bigger bulldog for me than y'all ever know. And she'll tell me, she goes, they ain't treating you right, you need to get on away from that. Leave them alone. And she's doing that because she loves me. Well, usually I take that to God, and I found out in a couple situations that uh, that's right where he wanted me to be. And he didn't tell me that she was wrong. He just wouldn't give me peace about getting out of it. And I've learned and I've grown through those situations. And I say that, that's not just a pastoral thing. Kyle gave a testimony, I think it was in Sunday school, a Sunday, about his job. And he wanted to move from one school system to another. But that how that he had seen God kind of do some things and God had given him hope that he's kept him right where he was at because he's got something going there that he wants him to be there. Um. Those are inconveniences and uncomfortable situations, and those are the easy ones. That, that we, we have to experience, know that, that in battle, things are not going to be rainbows and roses. And that's what I put up there. And you put whatever saying you have for that in your mind. We just got to get our mind that we're a soldier and we're not going to watch. Watching is not an option. We're in the battlefield, whether we want to be or not. 
We can either get hurt, we can either get knocked down, or we can stand up and fight with Jesus. And even when we fight, the victory is guaranteed, but there's injuries in the battle. And, and I'm, everybody here and everybody watching has a testimony, I'm sure, of how they've been in battle for God, and it's hurt them. That's part of it because Jesus sacrificed everything for us. And if we're called to follow him, we're called to live a life of sacrifice. I put it, soldiers always sacrifice. We, we was looking at this thing. We was watching TV last night. And we tried to watch the presidential debate, and that lasted about 10 minutes. Because I, I, don't, I don't know. I was giggling about one making fun of the other and didn't really get nothing out of it. And we decided we didn't want to go to bed all argumentative. So <laughs> we turned on something else. But we, we heard them saying something about the NBA players and how much they had sacrificed to get this season to happen and how much they had given up. And me and Brittany kind of came together and, and, and come together with the general idea that if you're getting paid millions of dollars to play a sport, your name and sacrifice don't belong together, right? I understand you had to spend some time away from your family. I get that. But that's not what a sacrifice is. You're, you're, just going, you're just going to do your job, man. But a soldier, a soldier don't, don't leave because he's getting paid millions of dollars. A, a soldier leaves because he's a soldier and there's some, a war to go fight. And this is kind of where we got, and, and God brought this back up to my mind today, is that a soldier leaves his, his house, leaves his family, no matter how big or small, and they go for like a year of deployments. And when they come back, it doesn't mean just because they went once that they're not going back again. And if it's a real bad time, they might not get to come back for very long. Even if they don't die, even if they don't get injured, they come back with PTSD. They come back with all kind of uh, disorders that go on because man was not made for war. And it absolutely destroys a man's mind, I believe, to see death and destruction and mayhem. So we focus on those things so when a man comes back normal, we say that he didn't sacrifice anything, but he did. They don't get paid a lot. And, and most of them you talk to, they, they didn't go for the money. There was the benefits that drew them in, but they went from, from a, a wanting to serve their country. Well, I say all that to say this, it, as Christians, I, I, I love America. And I would consider myself patriotic. But there's a lot of things that I would do for Jesus that, that right now I don't know that I could stand up and do for America. I would have a, a lot harder time. If I got drafted, I would go to war. And I would do what I needed to do. But it wouldn't be as easy for me to go and make that stand for my country as that it would for my Jesus. And that's because the, 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 the master that I serve isn't a job that I signed up for. Now, now the pastor, I, 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 the, being a preacher and a pastor, I agreed to it. But I didn't sign up for that. It wasn't my idea. Being a Christian is a calling. Being a Christian is laying down your life and taking it up and following Jesus. You enroll yourself in the war. You enroll yourself as a soldier. And we have to get it in our minds that that's who we are. That's what we're doing. We don't have to get down on ourselves. We don't have to be upset when things don't go right. I know we are. I know situations are going to come in our life and they're going to hurt us and they're going to destroy, try to destroy us. But what I'm telling you, if we know what to expect, that we're going to have some really dark moments in this life, but Jesus is going to be in the midst of it, we can get through it, right? We don't have to go through that plus what's going on in our life. We don't have to go through that plus Try, try to figure out how to get out of a situation when God just wants us to trust him. Miss Brittany, go to the next slide. This thing closed out. Keys to being a soldier. And this is where we're going to spend most of our time if, if we can get through it. You're supposed to focus on your job. And that, that's the first one we want to talk about. It's a mindset that we need to have and we need to train. And that's where we get our verse that we studied for a couple months about studying our Bible. 
Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We're supposed to train, we're supposed to build ourselves up because we're focusing on that we are in a war. We're keeping it fresh in our minds. But I wanted to show you this word, Miss Brittany, if you go to the next one. Look with me back in, in verse 4. It says, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. And I put this word up there. It's implicate. And, and it literally means to interweave or intertwine the subject in with the world. So you being the subject. And it's not just you being in the world, but it's actually the world growing like a vine around you and becoming a part of you. And what he's saying is a good soldier would not be against Nazi Germany and then go live in Germany in an American uniform and practice Nazi ways. Does that make sense? That's the idea that he's given him, that you wouldn't go to the enemy's country and be involved in what they do because they're the enemy. As a Christian, we have to get this idea that, that we are in the world. We're, we're not supposed to be Amish, and I don't use that to make fun of them and to say they, that's where they get this idea, and, and some other uh, denominations also, that we, we can't be in the world. We've we'll, we'll, we got to be in the world if we're going to do anything for the world, right? We can't hide our light under a bush. Jesus told us that. But we can be in it, but we can't be intertwined in it. We can't let it take a part of us. And the interesting thing is, I, I put this up here because it's in the present passive. It means that this action is happening right now. And going forward. It wants to intertwine on you and go forward. The passive is that this is actively trying to do something to you. It's very, very light-bearing, if you want to put it that way, that a Christian needs to know that you don't have to have a love for the world for the world to get you. And I don't mean like the boogeyman. But the world is, is, the, is the devil's world system is put there to trip you up, to trap you, to ensnare you, to intertwine into your life with Jesus, to keep the power from your life. And that being in the passive means that Paul was saying is the world wants to entangle you. You don't have to make the choice to get out there in it. It's trying to set a trap for you. It is... It is presently objecting against you. I thought that was so interesting. Timothy, stay on track, son. That's what he's saying. Because you're a soldier, and a soldier don't get involved in this other junk. This is exactly what he was talking about. If you got your Bibles, look down at verse 26 with me. He says, And what they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. That's the same idea that he's given later on in the chapter. The devil has caught these other two fellows that we talked a little bit last week about. And they have fell in his trap. He was actively trying to trap them. He's actively seeking something. And our job as a soldier is to stand guard and not let this happen. And that's where we get the idea too about a soldier. We see soldiers as an offensive weapon. But so much of the Christian life... Our job is to go spread the message. And as we're spreading it, the job of a soldier is to go forward with the gospel and to watch out to keep this stuff from keeping me doing my job. I don't have to go out there and fight everything for it to be against me, I guess is what I'm saying. If you go to the next one, the second thing we have, we have to fight by the rules of engagement. And I wasn't in the military but I know some people that were, and I don't got all the details. And, you know, you see movies and what you see on movies or whatever. But they always, they go in a war zone. And, and if they're in a time of, of peace at the second, you know, they, they can't just shoot somebody because they're in the enemy. Because they're wearing an enemy uniform. They have to be holding a gun or they have to shoot first, depending on how, how the, the conflict is going. The same way we have to know what are the rules of engagement as a Christian. Am I supposed to go out in the world and just and just try to take out sin? And you say, well, yeah, but is, is that what Jesus said? That's not what Jesus said, is it? He didn't say go fix all the problems. He said go spread my gospel. Make disciples. 
baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Standing against sin is just a given in that. His power and his gospel fixing some of that sin, alleviating some of the evil in the world, is just a byproduct. But our job is not to go and fix problems. That's where we get real tr- in real trouble as Christians with all the social justice and those things going on. Our heart goes out and we want to make everything right. But if we're not careful, we get off and all we do is get entrapped in an argument. We get entrapped on a side and it's the same thing with the... You can't, I can't even say not one thing about a presidential debate or a presidential candidate without being labeled a racist or, or being okay with Democrats. And that's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. I have to be, so I can't even make a comment about what I do or don't like, or I have to face a whole bunch of others. But I've come to find out that I don't have to, I have to be okay with that because that's not my job. My job's not to fix politics. My job is not to fix Donald Trump or Joe Biden. They're both yahoos to me. And I know it. And they proved it last night. God is going to put one of them in the election. My job is to ask Jesus who he wants me to vote for. And your job is to ask Jesus who he wants you to vote for. Because, see, that's a distraction. My rules of engagement are to take, and if you go to the next slide, my rules of engagement are to take the gospel at all costs to go forward, to go out, to tell the world. But listen to what he says in verse 5. And if a man also strive for mastery, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. He gives us the idea, an example to, to Timothy, of an athlete. And if an athlete is going to win the game, he's got to follow the rules. That's where I get this idea that we have rules to follow about what we're supposed to be doing. And it helps us stay out of these deep traps that we get into, these arguments. Sin is sin, and me telling you sin is sin is not going to fix it unless God's power is working through me because he put me there to tell you exactly what it is. I could go to a bar on Friday night, and I could stand up and preach the gospel. If Jesus Christ did not send me there, if his spirit did not lead me to that place, it will be to zero effect. See what I'm saying? So I want to know exactly what my call is, exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. He gives us a little bit more of an idea down in verse 25. Miss Brittany, go, go back one and tell me what that verse was. I done lost some spot. Yeah, verse 24 through 26, read here. He says, In the servant of the Lord must not strive... But be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God preadventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. And what they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. He gives us the idea that we're supposed to be gently with meekness. And meekness is such an important word that, that, that tells us who Jesus is and, and how he, he did business when he was on this earth. Meekness means I know I might have all the power in the world, but I have the wisdom of when to use it. Meekness is acting in a gentle way, although knowing I could absolutely destroy you. That is how we're supposed to fight. Miss Brittany, going back to the, to the next one. That's how we're supposed to fight. Yes, please. Yeah, there you go. We're supposed to fight in the same way that Jesus did. Jesus didn't fix every problem. If, if men and women came to him, he healed them. He spread the gospel. When they tried to kill him, he didn't put them down. He didn't put them out. That wasn't his job to overthrow nothing. It was his job to be Jesus, to be the son of God. And, and we, he, when we mimic him, it's in meekness, gentleness, and suffering. And that's sometimes we, we see those three and we don't see boldness. But I believe Jesus was pretty bold, don't y'all? I believe when, when, when Jesus walked into the temple and he saw them people changing money, uh, he wasn't, I don't think he was real calm and quiet and went over and just says, mm, 
threw the table over and cleaned the stuff out and told him to get out. No, it says he was mad. And he went in there and tore that place up and told him exactly who they are. But he, all, but he could have went in there and just said, you die, you die, you die, and you die. Because you've defaced my house. Right? But that's not what needed to happen, was it? No, that's not what needed to happen. So we have to go with the message, but we have to be wise as a serpent, but harmless as a dove, as Jesus said in Matthew 7. Miss Brittany, now if you'll go to the next one. So we, we have to realize how, how we go forward as a soldier. And, and this, this is a, a di more difficult one to understand, but if you listen at verse 6, the husbandman that laboreth must first partake of the fruits. He goes from the example of what a soldier is from an athlete to a farmer. Now, an athlete fights the battle, fights the, plays the game according to the rules. Okay, we get that. The rules of who we are is how we got to play, how we got to win, how we got to fight. But how we survive is off the fruit of what we're planting. And I'm not talking about monetarily. I'm right now, I'm living off the gospel, and it is awesome. But one day, if God called me to another church, and I couldn't be full-time, well, he'd give me a job. But I would still be living off the gospel because I'm not going to find this, this, and this. I'm waiting for him to give me what I need. The same thing for you. You may not be a pastor. You may not be in full-time ministry. But it does not mean you can't live by the gospel. It's the provision of Jesus Christ. And even deeper than this, than, than just the physical means, the, the biggest part of this is we don't strive for personal gain. We get any personal fulfillment, and I put it there physically, emotionally, or spiritually, because of who we are in Christ. We fight the battle, and we keep our confidence. We have our orders, and we have our boldness. Because of what we're being fed with from Jesus. The job provides first fruits for us. He provides enough for us to give everybody else. But I can't keep giving and giving and giving if I ain't eating myself. That's what he's talking, giving us the example here of a farmer. If a farmer ain't eating, he ain't going to be farming for very long. And some of you can... can, can uh, Give, give testimony to that. Some of y'all still. I, I've, I've, I've tasted their fruits. I know Brother Doug keeps bringing stuff by the house. And uh, we got bell peppers in the freezer right now. But you can't eat them all at once. But I don't reckon he could eat them all either. I had to start getting them out. But they're good. But if he wasn't eating, it wasn't doing no, he couldn't keep farming if he wasn't eating some of his own fruit. Make sense? That's the same idea we have here. We're supposed to war, but... We don't, we don't just war for the job and we don't just, just work for Christ. We're also provided for by him. And it, this takes, every bit of this takes the, the, the emphasis off us and our Christian life and puts it on Christ and his army that we're a part of. Miss Brittany, if you go to the next one, please. And we're, we're almost done. Probably one of the, the biggest things is remember why you're doing what you're doing. And you can go to the next one, Miss Brittany. If you look with me down at verse 8, he says this. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Wherein I suffer trouble as an even do, evildoer, even unto, my, unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Paul is telling us that he keeps up to what he's doing, even when it puts him in bonds like an evildoer, he keeps going for the glory of God to spread the gospel. Paul, the Bible does not portray Paul as somebody who was self-serving and tried to build a name for himself as the best Christian. He wasn't worried about what it looked like. He was worried about the fruit that it was going to bear. He was worried about if he was doing and taking care of the stewardship that Jesus had given him. 
And if we get off track and we start fighting for ourselves to be the best singer or the best uh, music player or the best this or this or this, where others can see it, we absolutely lose fruit. If I, if I try to be the best preacher that you've ever heard, well, I'm, I'm going to be the worst one you ever heard. Because my focus has changed from what God wants to what I can do. And if we don't remember what, why we're doing what we're doing, there's mighty men of God who have, who have fallen into all kind of sin, and some have been pastors, some have been just deacons or great examples. They have fell in all kinds of sin because their eye got taken off their prize and the strength of where they, get, where they ate from turned to what they could do and not what God was giving them. And you say, why is that? Well, they wanted to feel some desire that God wasn't feeling. Instead of going to God to get that desire filled and, and have that taken care of, they took it in their own hands to take care of themselves. And, and whatever the sin may be, that's not remembering what we're fighting for. If, if I wanted to make money, if I wanted fame, I wouldn't be a pastor because I can't take credit for anything that I do. If I wanted the emphasis to be on me, I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. I want to be like 70 years old and still be the pastor of this church and have my kids and everybody's kids that are, that are my age and younger come up. And, and I want them to say, man, he's been my pastor for this long. And, 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 you know, God used him here, here, and here. But the biggest thing about that is I just want to be used to God. Like, I want, I, want, I want somebody to be able to say, be like, yeah, man, God worked at this place. And like, that, but that's not this evil desire. I just want to see God work in our ministry. I just want to see God work in our church. But if that ever turns to, well, I need this, and I need this for me, and I need this for me, that's a good example of where that's going to go off the rails really fast, and nothing good is going to come out of it. Plug your own name and your own ministry and your own career into that. If you change tires for a living, do it for Jesus. Don't do it so that you can be the best tire changer. You ought to be doing it because Jesus put you there to change tires to give you money to live for him. And that we, don't, we don't see that. But the basis of what we're supposed to be doing is spreading the gospel, which is the word of God. We're supposed to be focused on eternity. That's why we spread the gospel, right? If people didn't die and go to hell, if they just went to a, a you know, not heaven, then well, that wouldn't be that bad, Right? God, I just hope you save them. I don't have to have a burden about that. But man, people's going to go burn for all of eternity. It ought to hurt us to know that we could do something about that and not do it. That's what we're fighting for. So that, that God will be able to use us to put a dent in that number that's going to hell. And the, the reason the, this whole book is written, the reason Jesus redeemed us, the reason Jesus made us to begin with is for his glory. It's for his power to be seen. He didn't need to do any of that, but he did it because he's God and he wants the glory from his creation. Those are the things we're fighting for. And none of that has to do with us. Miss Brittany, if you go to the last one. Matter of fact, we'll, we'll just save that for next week. It, it, it's already 7.50. We'll be 8.15. I keep on and on. We are soldiers for Christ. And I don't care where you are living, where you are in your, in your life for Christ. If you're born again, you're a soldier. You might not be on the front lines anymore. You might be on the supportive role. You might be in the middle of everything. I, I don't know. That all just depends on where God's put you. But the, the, the important thing is not where you're at. It's what you are. And if you be who God's made you to be, you'll be pleasing to him and he'll get glory from you. That's our, that's our one goal in this life. So keep in mind this week, when we go out, you're not just somebody. You don't just go to church. And, and if it's true, you drop your churchiness and follow Jesus. If you're not saved, you ought to get saved. You say, I don't know how to. Well, give us a call. Talk to me. You need to make sure that, that you're living this life that Jesus says we're supposed to be living because he's given you something that's worth living for. And if you ain't got nothing to live for, you ain't met him, man. 
I'm just, I'm just telling you. So this week, let's act like soldiers. Let, let's live like soldiers. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for this time in your word. And let us pray that uh, you, would, you would bless us with the courage and strength to go forward for you. And, and Jesus, to war as, as a good soldier, as, a, as a, a good child for you, Lord, whatever our ministry is. And we just ask for your touch upon us as we leave. Help those that are sick. Help those that weren't able to be here. Uh, Lord, we just ask that you would bless our nation in this, this coming time of, of election. Lord, you know exactly what you want done, and we just pray that your will would be done and that none would try to stop it. Father, we, we ask for your blessing upon us as we leave. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, we will see you all Sunday morning.